YouTubers. My name is Tom Rich, and I've created this video series in order to provide users like you with a better understanding on reliability tests and validation topics. Today's video is on sample size determination, which I've created based on an overwhelming amount of requests that I've received from users like you. I hope you enjoy this video, and if you do, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Thank you again for watching, and let's get started. In this video, we're going to learn about sample size determination. How many samples should your company use for testing? Again, my name is Tom Risch, and if you like this video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Thank you for your support. Today we're going to talk about definitions, basic terminology, and an introduction to sampling plans. We're going to learn how to calculate reliability and confidence. We're going to learn how do you choose your reliability and confidence sample size targets. And we're also going to learn what reliability and confidence sample size targets are optimal for your product. Below is a high level summary that highlights the process from requirements to end results and reporting. In this video, we will cover one of the components of verification and validation plan step, which is the sample size determination or the sampling plan. Before we get into this concept in more detail, let's review a few definitions to refresh our memories and prepare to tackle the sample size determination problem. What is a sample size? A sample size is the number of test specimens or test units used to represent the behavior of a population for a specific condition or set of conditions. What is a population? In this case, a population is the total number of products that your company will build for a product line. Let's go ahead and pick out a few samples from our population. Let's go ahead and pull these samples out of our population. So we have selected six samples, or we have selected a sample size of six. Now a quick note on this is that this is just a arbitrary sample size to show the relationship between population and sample size. I'm not telling you to use six samples in every single instance or for every single product. We'll go into more detail in this video on how to select a sample size based on your company's objectives and the specific product you are testing. One more additional note is any sample size chosen that is less than 100% coverage of the entire population has a risk. The key to a successful sampling plan is to select a sample size that falls into the behavioral region of the entire population while working within the limitations of your company's objectives and the product itself. We will cover this in more detail later in this video. Let's go ahead and define a sampling plan. A sampling plan tells us how many products will be tested to determine if a design or process is acceptable. We're going to cover two types of sampling plans in this video, AQL sampling plans and LTPD sampling plans. What is AQL? AQL stands for Acceptable Quality Limit, which is the minimum allowable worst case process average or mean expressed as a percentage that is considered acceptable or the percentage of defects that will be accepted at any given time. A downside to AQL sampling plans is that they require a high sample size. So if you are performing any kind of testing that's destructive or degrades a product to the point where it cannot be sold to a customer, it can be very costly to your company. Also, it is a moving average between lots. What this means is that you will not know the exact performance of an individual lot using an AQL sampling plan. Let's go ahead and define an LTPD sampling plan. LTPD stands for Lot Tolerance Percent Defective. The percentage of defective products or parts that will be rejected at any given time. I really like LTPD sampling plans because they tell you a lot about a specific lot. In other words, it's lot specific and testing will give you the LTPD percentage at a specified confidence level for that particular lot. What do sampling plans such as AQL and LTPD tell us? It tells us the alpha or producer's risk and the beta or the consumer's risk. With an AQL plan, we are determining the probability and risk of rejecting a lot that is actually good. 
While in a LTBD plan, we are determining the probability and risk of accepting a defective lot which ends up in the user's hands. Take a look at the two tables on the bottom right hand corner. The one on the left is an example of an AQL sampling plan. The one on the right is an example of an LTPD sampling plan. Notice that both the AQL and LTPD tables have a sample size for each different AQL and LTPD percentage. That either allows failures with an increased sample size or do, do not allow failures with a, with a smaller sample size. For each AQL limit and LTPD limit, you will need to choose whether or not you will allow any test failures for your product dependent on the application and whether or not the condition being tested has any safety or regulatory and compliance implications. Now let's go ahead and define reliability and confidence, which are key parameters in defining a sampling plan and is used primarily in design verification and validation sample size determination. What is reliability and confidence? Reliability and confidence is the probability of the population performing to specification. For a tested condition with a specified period of time and the percentage of certainty that the samples that were tested represent the behavior and performance of the entire population. In more simple terms, let's ask two questions. For reliability, what are the chances of my product's population in the field surviving a stress, load, pressure, temperature, or other type of condition for the specified operational life? Likewise, with confidence, we can ask, how sure am I that my sample size represents how the population will perform during the operational life in a customer's hands or in, in usage. Some pitfalls to keep in mind when developing a reliability and confidence sampling plan for your product is to ensure that the sample size falls within the distribution of your population. Sample size that's too small can result in getting results from samples that are outliers of your population which can have catastrophic or negative results, such as over-designing or under-designing your product. So keep that in mind to select a sample size that will give you an idea of how your population actually behaves. Now let's go back to the original six samples that we selected when we were defining sample size and population. We will use these samples in the next slide for our example. Okay, now we're ready to learn how to determine sample size based on reliability and confidence. We will cover two equations in this video. However, there are other methods that can be used to calculate reliability and confidence based on sample sizes, such as testing beyond the operational life of the product. However, we will focus on the following equations for this activity. The first is the natural logarithmic equation for reliability and confidence sample size determination. The second is the bi non-parametric binomial equation. The major difference between these two equations, besides the complexity of solving the equation, is that the natural log equation does not consider allowable failures, while the binomial equation takes into account allowable failures. Recall that these are options listed under the sampling plans for both AQL and LTPD tables. The math behind LTPD and reliability and confidence sample, sampling calculations when considering allowable failures is very similar. The key difference is the specific definitions and presentation of the values where LTPD, if you remember, is the percentage of the failures that will de be detected and rejected and reliability being the percentage of the population which will perform at a specific condition during the lifetime of the product in the field. Now, for this example, we're going to take the six samples that we selected from the population in slide 3 and calculate the reliability based on a 90% confidence. A quick note, when defining the sampling plan, you can set a confidence level that fits your specific requirements. A standard value used for reliability and confidence and LTPD sampling plans is 90% confidence level. So we will use this for our example. We will not include allowable test failures for this example, so we will select the natural log equation. Okay, another quick note is, since we already know our sample size, what we're determining here is our reliability component. So we have two knowns here. We, we know what our sample size is, and we know what our confidence is. 
So let's go ahead and plug these values into our into the equation. Okay, and let's go ahead and solve for R. So in this example, with a confidence level of 90% and six samples, we have a reliability probability of 62%. So for our reliability and confidence levels for this example, we have an R62 and a C90. What do these R and C values tell us? They tell us that given a sample size of six and a 90% confidence level, 62% of our population will perform as desired under the tested condition during the operational life of the product in the field 90% of the time. Now keep in mind that the population may outperform or underperform against our reliability and confidence to, uh, values that we found based on a few factors, such as late design improvements, process improvements for positive examples, or for negative examples, uh, changes or deviations to the design or process that negatively impact our product. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the binomial equation. Using a 90% confidence level and plugging in different values for our reliability and allowable failures generates a table of reliability percentages and allowable failures at a 90% confidence level. Now as you can see this is very similar to the LTPD table that we discussed earlier. So how do you decide reliability sample size targets for your product? Let's take a step back now and look at two items that impact reliability of a product. Number one is the product design. A design that is not suited for the environment and conditions it will be subjected to can lead to early failures and high warranty costs. Number two is how the product is built. If you have an inconsistent build process or your design was not optimized for manufacturability, you can end up with significant variability between each product built. How do we mitigate the two risks listed above? With a validation plan and a sampling plan tailored toward your particular product. Going back to the AQL and LTPD tables, a standard sampling plan such as these two sampling strategies may align with the needs and each has its benefits and negatives based on your design and production requirements respectively. Whether you develop your own sampling plan based on natural logarithmic or non-parametric or parametric binomial equations or other strategies, you will need to develop the targets based on your company's specific needs, objectives, and limitations facing your company. Another factor to take into consideration the risks identified with the product and the severity and impact of the field failures and the application and use of the product you are developing and producing. Safety and regulatory risks should be heavily weighted factors in establishing your reliability and confidence sampling plan. Now let's take a look at the inputs and factors that drive how to develop your sampling plan. What reliability and confidence sample size targets are optimal for your product? There are multiple factors that need to be taken into account when defining reliability and confidence sample size targets. These are broken up into four inputs. Number one is the cost of the product or system to be tested and the time and resources that your company has available. Number two is the amount of risk tied to the condition or function that will be tested against. Number three is the test stage and pedigree for your product where it is currently at when you begin testing. Company objectives for your quality engineering validation teams and your business units also need to be taken into account when defining how many samples you will test. Item 2 highlights an important point where you should tie your sample sizes to predetermined risks based on components, subsystem, system requirements, as was touched upon briefly. This can be implemented via strategies in your DEFEMA, which can be used to drive key conditions and sample sizes that should be captured in your verification or validation plan based on the risk identified for that condition. Item three also highlights an important point. Testing early and filling early are critical parts of a successful product development life cycle. However, keep in mind that the approach needs to be intelligent and well thought out. Early in the product development before the design is locked, 
specified tooling is produced and or production processes are well defined and established, you do not want to waste a substantial amount of money, time, and resources on testing a pedigree of a product or system that is not at a production representative level with a large sample size. Now, it's highly encouraged to ensure features and functionality of early pedigree parts work and perform as intended in earlier stages and design stages. However, save your money and resources tied to larger sample sizes for later stages when results are more representative of your pro production product. Again, this is tied to the risk of the condition that will be tested. Keep in mind, safety and high warranty cost risks should be tested for with a higher level of reliability and confidence, which would include a larger sample size. On the right hand of the side of the slide, we visually summarize what we just discussed, which are the four key elements, factors, or inputs which are required to establish a reliability and confidence sampling plan that is tailored specifically to your product and company, which aligns with your company's goals and objectives. Let's go ahead and summarize the key takeaways from the sample size determination topic, which are establish your sampling plan early based on the four inputs discussed on slide eight. Remember, there is no such thing as a cookie cutter sampling plan. Your sampling plan needs to be dynamic to meet your specific company needs and must be easily adapted, adaptable to various product lines that your company may produce. Using a sampling plan for a, or a sample size table from a standard without understanding the driving inputs for establishing your targets can lead to underestimating the actual design performance by testing an insufficient sub sample size, which can result in false results from outliers of the population. Or on the opposite side of the spectrum, test more samples than required, which leads to higher operational costs for your company. Select a sample size that produces meaningful data and input into your product development. I am simply reframing the statements in, the, in bullet point two as it is important to understand you are selecting a sample size and test condition that provides a high probability of your product's population and performance against requirements and that will provide input into making design and process improvements. Keep in mind, you only get one shot at both maintaining and increasing the brand equity for your company. So you need to put a lot of thought into building a robust validation plan, which includes a well thought out reliability and confidence sampling plan. Thank you YouTubers for watching this video. And once again, if you enjoyed it, please hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. I hope you stick around for the rest of the videos of my channel and there's plenty of new content coming and I will be updating weekly. Thank you again for watching and enjoy the rest of your day.